everybody, I'm Sarah and I'm a recorder player. Today I am going to be giving you an introduction to the voice flute. This is a pretty lesser known variety of recorder and despite being called a voice flute, it's neither a flute nor uses your voice. It's actually a recorder in D, so a tone higher than the tenor or a minor third lower than the alto, called the voice flute because it fits the range of the human voice. It's typically used to play French Baroque flute music, to be specific, and it sounds like this. This is such a special instrument. It's small enough to be agile like the alto, but its larger size gives it this mournful sound and all of the cross fingerings you have to use when playing it makes it sound really haunting. My voice flute is handmade in boxwood by Tim Cranmore, who's a British maker, and it's copied after the original Denner voice flute in Franz Bruchen's collection. If you're a recorder player, you'll be like, ooh, if you're not, you'll be like, I understood about one of those words. These Baroque instruments are typically tuned in 415, so if you have perfect pitch, you'll notice that the lowest note, mm, notated as a D, sounds as a C sharp. And they fit the same range as the Traverso, the French Baroque flute, and play the same repertoire. Right. <laughs> Normally when I do these introduction videos, introduction to sopranino, bass, scarcline, whatever, it's quite straightforward. For the voice flute, I ended up on this rabbit hole of research, getting more and more complicated. Where does it come from? What is it played for? Is it a tenor or an alto? Uh, and everything I read seemed to add more confusion to the fire because fires are fueled by confusion. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need some coffee. For a start, recorders in D have been around for a really long time. Recorder maker Adrian Brown has compiled a database of Renaissance recorders, original instruments still surviving today, and many of these are in D. In fact, there are recorders existing in every key. When we say a recorder is in D, that roughly means that if you close the holes and then play a scale up, that's the scale of D major. Those same fingerings on a tenor will give you the scale of C major, on an alto, F major. And then when we get to the Baroque, I'm talking 18th century, late 17th century here, there are many original voice flutes surviving, so we can look at them and be like, oh, the number in my head is 35 instruments surviving, but there are undoubtedly more. Most of these original voice flutes were being made by Bressan, a very well-known recorder maker resident in England. Now, the interesting thing about these Bressan models, according to our recorder maker, Tim Cranmore, was that the bore was very wide, giving a range of only an octave and a fifth. Ooh. Normally, Baroque instruments can go much higher. Tim pointed out, Bressan was a master recorder builder. He knew how to build an instrument with two octaves. So this must have been a choice. Tim's theory is that these Bressan voice flutes weren't intended as soloistic instruments, but as consort instruments intended to be played together in a group. And that's gonna be important later. There are other voice flutes surviving from makers such as Rippet or Stainsmeet, but a very interesting one is the Denner model. Mine is modelled after a denner. Long time viewers and recorder nerds will know that I love a good denner. Uh, was a recorder maker who later lived in Nuremberg and he trained in France. He left behind an instrument in D. Though, according to recorder maker Jacqueline Sorel, she reckons that this wasn't actually intended as a voice flute because the proportions and the build of that instrument are different to voice flutes at the time. Maybe it was intended as a high tenor recorder or a low alto recorder. Because here's where it gets confusing. The name of the recorder's voice, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, isn't only about the pitch it's at, but its build and design and function. You'll have voice flutes at low baroque pitch sounding at the same notes than tenors at high renaissance pitch. 
Uh, what does this mean and does it matter? Well, I'm getting there. Okay, so there's quite a few instruments surviving, but are people talking and writing about these? In my research, I came across this amazing article by David Lasocki. You can buy it from his website for one dollar, so if you're into voice flutes, please go and do that. The first example we have of voice flutes being mentioned in writing was in the diary of Thomas Britton in the late 17th century. He was an amateur player who was jotting down some notes and exercises for practicing his recorder. What a good student. And he wrote, for my great flutes, one tone and a half lower than the treble common flute. So this treble common flute is our alto, the great flute is our voice flute. Another example in writing were in the household objects of the Otter family, very famous family of composers, uh, musicians, instrument builders. Time for me to pronounce some French. So in their household accounts they mentioned taille des flutes or altos and grosse taille des flutes or voice flutes. Notice how the voice flutes are basically called big altos. Okay, this is further argument for the side that a voice flute is a big alto, not a small tenor. Then in 1721, you have the composer and performer Louis wowing the court at Versailles by playing in a way that it sounded like there were 40 men having a brawl. And here, in, uh, and in the record of these events, voice flutes are referred to as flute de voix, flute de voix, voice flute. And we see this flute de voix translated into other languages. For example, in Amsterdam, it has been recorded as a zangflaut, so that's literally song flute. Even though the names weren't standardized, these instruments were evidently well known. So what kind of music was played on them? In David Lasocki's article, he sets out a convincing argument that the voice flute came to prominence in the compositions of Lully, Lully, Lully. French composer, loved writing for ballet and dance, loved writing for the recorder. And here you have these grand compositions and there are pieces of music with recorders doubling the human voice. The human voice, singers. These would be altos and voice flutes together, doubling the female singers with continuo as well. And where did it go from here? There aren't actually that many surviving pieces written specifically for voice flute. of what we play is French Baroque flute music because it fits exactly the range of the traverso flute. There is a catch to this and I'll get to that later but at this point I just want to ask if we had this voice flute gradually spreading all over Europe, being seen in the courts, being performed for kings, why didn't it catch on? Why aren't we all playing on voice flutes now? We can't know exactly, but we do know that in France, the traverso flute caught on very early and this could have overtaken it in popularity. We know that the voice flute was popular for longer in England. Another theory I have for why the voice flute didn't stay so popular, I'm gonna get into now, and that's to do with how it's played. So, voice flutes are in D. All your fingers down is a D, just the left hand is an A. Today, us recorder players do learn a whole new set of fingerings to play the voice flute. If you want to do this, it's not actually as hard as it sounds. I have a cheat for you if you can already read the bass clef. Take a piece of music, take your voice flute, pretend you're reading in bass clef and add three flats. That's voice flute reading. Otherwise, the voice flutes are tone higher than the tenor, so you pretend you're reading tenor and then play a tone lower. The thing is, with a lot of music on voice flute, it ends up being in a really, really tricky key. Now, we say that voice flutes are the same range as the traverso, this flute, which they are, but on a traverso flute, the D is played with six fingers. On the voice flute, it's played with seven fingers. Although it comes out sounding the same, your fingers are working in a different key, if that makes sense. Playing in F major on a traverso is quite straightforward. On a voice flute, this is so interesting to me because cross fingerings give a really different sound color than open ones. And Baroque music is all about color. 
I can completely get that a musician would prefer to play something in a very easy key on an alto rather than a cross fingery key on a voice flute. The ironic thing is that when we play a lot of baroque music on the alto we still transpose it up a minor third uh, to make it fit. We're still playing those funky voice flute fingerings just on an alto recorder. Um, oh my gosh I'm talking myself in circles. Let's play, let's play, let's play you a little bit of repertoire. First of all, I found you one of these sweets by Dupart that is originally for voice flute. I found it on IMSLP, so you can play it too. And indeed, at the top it says, une flûte de voix. Preludes by Otter. Italian, some sonatas for traverso flute by Locatelli because why not? So here's a tip, when you're choosing flute music to play on your voice flute, pick something with sharps. To demonstrate, let me pick something with flat. In this passage, every single note ends up being flattened. Look at this. Uh. And there are contemporary composers writing for the voice flute. I featured this on Team Recorder before, but this is Gentle Walker by Zayna Clark, written for tenor or voice flute and voice. <laughs> and what about instruments that you can play on today? At the moment that I know of, the voice flutes available to buy are handmade by master recorder makers. I don't know of any mass produced ones. This means beautiful artisanal top quality instruments, but they come with a price tag. The voice flute models available today tend to be designed after the Bressan or the Denner models that I talked about. You'll notice that it does have the full Baroque range, even though those Bressan models 
only had a range of an octave and a fifth. That is the wonderful thing about recorders, they're ever changing, ever evolving. Recorder makers today may very well tweak the designs to give that larger range so that it can play the full range of music. It's common practice to take the design or proportions of an original instrument and adapt it into a new size or a new pitch. Because we also have to be realistic for today's market. And you know what today's market for voice flute wants? Maybe not like that. Uh, usually these introduction videos are quite simple, but I... Do I dare to make some conclusions? A voice flute is a recorder. When I first got my voice flute many years ago, I was just like, oh, cool, recorder in D, let's play. I did not realise what a labyrinth of questions lay behind this. I'm gonna put so many links for further research down in the description. Most of the information I found was actually on the websites of different recorder builders, and I love hearing their thoughts and philosophies behind the instruments that they're building as well as the fantastic research by David Lasaki, it was for the American Recorder Society. Again, you can buy this article for a dollar, as well as many others on his website, and please go and do that and support his work. And the question, is a voice flute a big alto or a small tenor? In the end, I think it's its own thing. And that's beautiful. Oh my God, oh! <laughs> A bird just flew right at me in the window. Ah. As always, you can subscribe to my channel by clicking on my face down here. Over here is the Team Recorder Patreon where you can choose to support Team Recorder. And up here is the difference between German, French and Italian Baroque music because I know you will love that, you nerds. Thanks for watching and have a great day.